We welcome our viewers to this conversation. Zachary Chase Lipton joins us from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, where he's recently joined as assistant professor. He helped develop Amazon's deep learning framework, MXNet, and is widely acclaimed as a rising star in the world of machine learning and AI. He's also a jazz saxophonist a couple of years ago. And in the context of this uh, conversation today, Zach is um, acclaimed as a voice of reason and sobriety, uh, especially when the lion's share of uh, popular prose on AI tends to play out on the extremes. Thank you, Zach, for your time today. Hey, thanks for, thanks for having me. Zach, uh, you speak and write with great enthusiasm on a specific issue these days, the snake oil variety of discourse uh, and how everybody is dancing around the term AI itself. So tell us, if it is not what it's being bandied about as, what is it and what is it not? Well, the... I mean, part of the problem with the conversation now is that, um, you know, it's usually not even, uh, it's not given, there is no discussion in the wider discourse about what the technology actually is, right? People speak about it in terms of um, sort of doomsday scenarios or like utopian ideas of, you know, sort of like futurist kind of uh, like aesthetic or, you know, about the lifestyle they hope it will bring but no one actually talks about the technology. So it's not even, I, I think most people don't even have a specific enough idea about the technology, let alone like a wrong idea, but something even so specific enough as to be called a concrete idea. Um, I think it, it's easier to talk about what it is and what it's not maybe, because I think the what it's not is sort of, uh, is, is sort of vague and amorphous. It's just the word gets used as a sort of wild card. Um, what it is, is basically we're really good at something called function fitting. So um, I have uh, a bunch of inputs and a bunch of outputs, and I want a function that's gonna map these inputs to the corresponding outputs, and hopefully in a sufficiently um, smooth way that it's going to um, generalize or apply to points I've never seen before. That sounds pretty abstract, but a, a concrete example would be, um, you know, you've all done this if you took like some kind of high school science class and you, you measure the pressure and you measure the temperature or something like this and you try to see how does one influence the other and so you um, get a bunch of measurements and you have a 2d plot and then you say i want to find the best fit line so when you look for the best fit line that connects a bunch of points on a graph you're doing some kind of curve fitting um, in that case you happen to only have two dimensions so you're mapping one dimensional input to one dimensional output things get a lot more complicated when you say i have a high resolution photograph so um, even a low resolution photograph like one that would fit the size of a postage stamp on your computer, uh, on your monitor, would have, you know, maybe 200 pixels by 200 pixels. So that's actually, now you have 200 by 200 is 40,000 pixel regions, and then each one has a red, a green, and a blue value. So now you have to take 120,000 numbers, and then instead of mapping it to a real number, you might map it to one of a number of categories that say, uh, correspond to what kind of object is in the, um, is in the image or which among a large set of say celebrity faces do you recognize or something like that um, so the fact that we're able to do this is really exciting right because that's the technology that uh you know that can map from inputs to outputs it's able to learn behavior that we don't know how to directly hard code into computers right so nobody knows how to just sit down and write a system that's going to recognize faces nobody knows how to just sit down and program a system that's going to translate from english to hindi but if we are given, say, 10 million sentences in English, and each sentence has a corresponding sentence in Hindi, then we can learn a system which is going to do a very elaborate and very high dimensional and very advanced form of this sort of curve fitting and say, hey, when I see sentences that are like this, you know, they tend to correspond to words like this in the other language. Um, and so this is what's behind the phone, uh, the voice recognition on your phone. It's what's behind uh, language translation in Google Translate. It's what's behind the software that makes Facebook recognize your face or your friends' faces when you upload photographs. In that case, you know, it had a whole bunch of labeled data and the labeled data came from us because we've been sitting there mindlessly for the last 10 years, clicking on ourselves and annotating ourselves as being in every single photograph that we see. Um, so that's all really exciting. I think where things go completely off the rails is people, um, sort of don't recognize that function fitting isn't everything. 
Um, and so they start thinking like uh, they could just make sort of wild claims about the capabilities of um, machine learning systems. And, and the idea is that, well, if we've gotten good at all these progressively harder function fitting tasks, eventually we'll be able to do anything that a human can do. Um, the problem is there's a lot of things that sort of aren't addressable directly within that paradigm. They require um, a different maybe mode of thinking altogether, and we haven't necessarily had the same kinds of meteoric advances. So uh, a really good example is causal reasoning. So when people say, uh, you see these articles that are floating around saying like your next boss might be an AI or your next doctor might be an AI. So for a very specialized task where that task could be distilled down to nothing more than pattern recognition, yeah, a machine learning system might be able to do it reliably. Um, the challenges are, um, if the task isn't just to do pattern recognition, but to say, hey, if I do something different, if I come up with a different policy than what I normally would have done in the past, um, how is the world gonna react? If I intervene and do something that wouldn't have been done historically, you know, what are gonna be the ramifications of this action? This requires a kind of causal reasoning. Um, we call like, uh, you're asking a counterfactual question. You're saying if something happened that wouldn't have happened historically. Um, so we're able to answer these kinds of questions, right? Um, if you see a rainbow colored dog, um, you know that it's a dog. Uh, the machine learning system has never seen a rainbow colored dog um, that might be sufficiently different that it gets really confused and it doesn't know anything. Um, the reason why you know is, well, you know something about how the world works. You know how paint works and you know what a dog is. So you can extrapolate from that information to ask the counterfactual question, well, do I know of a process? You know, well, what could I have done that would have made a dog turn you know, rainbow colored? So Zach, if the research hasn't categorically changed, why are we rebranding it? Um, so when you say we, I mean, it's important to ask who's we. So that's the, that's, the que that's the thing that you've been writing about and talking about. So. <laughs> Yeah. Mm, yeah. So, and you know, it, it's hard to pinpoint a single actor. Yeah, there aren't. There, there are multiple actors. Yeah. So. so, so the research has the level of the research, the the level of progress at uh, specific things has changed, mm -hmm. right? But what what hasn't changed is the nature of the research. Um, so it's important to give maybe. Um, so we talked about this in the um, the tech review talk. Um, the it's important to give maybe some kind of historical uh, context, right? Uh, for um, the, the, what we've been calling this technology. So actually people used to call this whole field AI and there's nothing necessarily wrong with a word per se, like a word is just a placeholder, but the word, you know, we, 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 we endow a word with some meaning and thereafter expect that like when you use words, it's because you're trying to communicate with people not to, uh, to fool them. Um, so we had this term AI and it referred to a pretty expansive field, right? So it included um, some people doing the kind of statistical learning approaches that we're describing, but those weren't actually the dominant uh, methods. The real dominant methods at the time were things like expert systems. So hard-coded sets of rules where basically people would interview domain experts. You'd, you'd, you'd say you needed to uh, automate what someone does, so you'd interview them. You had some process for figuring out, you know, what are the set of rules that govern uh, the way they make decisions. And you try to distill it into uh, a very long, complicated set of rules. And um, eventually, uh, you, uh, you know, this, is, this was sort of the thing people were enthused about. And you could find, you could dig up like old, you know, 1980s or 1990s, like uh, articles and say like Harvard Business Review, people could talk about how uh, expert systems are gonna change the world. And uh, you had people looking at systems that uh, did tree search. So like the deep blue system that beat Gary Kasparov at uh, chess uh, had absolutely no machine learning involved. Um, this system simply, uh, it did a tree search. It looked, well, I have so many possible moves. And in response to my opponent has so many possible moves. In response, I in turn, you know, have a number of moves and you say, well, that it quickly gets out of hand. There's a sort of exponential blow up in the number of moves I need to consider as I look further ahead in the game. Um, but this is a system that had no machine learning at all. And there were all, this, all these different families of techniques for trying to replicate things that we thought required human intelligence. And we called that entire field AI. Um, and what happened was things kind of, people made a lot of big promises. People made a lot of sensational claims. People named systems in ways that suggested that they were 
uh, going to uh, have human-like uh, characteristics. And people made uh, sensational projections about how quickly we would be able to, you know, uh, you know, pick your choice of claim, you know, pass the Turing test, uh, do anything a human could do. Um, and those, for the most part, the, the field was seen as a little bit kind of like unbridled and undisciplined and uh, maybe lacking scientific rigor and um, making some kind of sensational claims. And basically people started avoiding the word AI because it became associated with unfulfilled promises. Okay. Um, and, I mean, so, so just to show what happened with that word is basically um, there was a group of people that were doing a flavor of what now looks like what we now machine learning, but like basically statistical based approaches. And they said, well, we don't want to be associated with the term AI. We're going to start calling this machine learning. And Can you hear me, Zach? All right, we'll just um, freeze this broadcast right here and we'll get right back. Thank you. <laughs> 